What does sin do to us? Take, take a few seconds and just talk to your neighbor if you feel free to do that and converse. Okay, one that beats you up. Anybody else want to share? Separates us from God. Separates us from God. Sin causes us to feel convicted, keeps us accountable, turns us back around, makes us feel guilty, can make your life miserable, keeps you awake, <laughs> doesn't let you sleep. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So, as we get started, remember that Jesus came to reverse the curse, that his whole mission was to help you not be so affected by sin. And today we're talking about thorns and thistles and how we um, still have struggles in this world. Even when Jesus has set us free, there are still struggles. So as we pray today, I want you to think about some struggles you have with the people, the things, the stuff around you. As we pray, uh, pray for those people around you who might be a thorn or thistle in your side. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would step into our lives, into our hearts again, that as we open your word this morning, that we would hear directly from you, that my words would be yours, and that all of us, our hearts, our hands, our eyes, our, our being is open to you and willing to receive what you have to offer. God, transform us, that we might be a blessing to the people around us. And God, the people that, that we might struggle with or that might give us grief in some way, that cause us pain or conflict or just in, in some way nag at us. God, we, we ask that you would help us to uh, show them love and kindness and compassion and to turn away from animosity or anger towards them. Um, and, and even the, the environment we live in, this world that we live in, God, help us to, to not view the painful things just as painful, but to see them as a way to train us to do uh, life in your desired way a growing, learning, maturing way. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. So once again, uh, we're, we're going through Genesis to get to everything else. So in Genesis chapter 1, we remember that there was freedom, absolute freedom. But in chapter 2, we find out, well, there's one restriction. What is that one restriction in chapter 2 of Genesis? You can eat from any tree, any tree whatsoever in the garden except for this one, or death comes. And there's always a restriction to life, isn't there? You are free to stop breathing anytime you would like. Anybody plan on doing that soon? <laughs> like, no. You're, you're free to stop eating and drinking anytime you like. There is no one requiring you to do all of that, right? But the moment you do, death ensues. Um, death, well, not exactly the moment, but very shortly thereafter. And so in that same way, there's always freedoms in life, but there's also always repercussions for when we step outside the bounds of what is healthy and good for us. So we, we, we need to be aware of that. So, but this morning, Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 18 are our main text reminding us where the thorns and thistles come from. Because you remember in Genesis 3, the... the uh, the snake comes along, tempts Eve and Adam, he's there, and they eat, and then God goes looking for him, and then there's struggle and tension and all this, and then the verse comes up, uh, and to the man the Lord said, the Lord God said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life, that's a long time, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grain. So by hard labor, you will work hard to scratch at that ground to, to make food. Now granted, most of us aren't in agricultural these days, right? Most of us have different jobs or retired from different jobs. But even yet, somebody is out there planting and growing and, and working hard to, to bring about food from the ground. And really, no matter what your job has been, you also have worked hard to get what you have in some sense, right? It, it's rare that people are handed everything and they don't have to do anything at all. Um, so uh, speaking of thorns and thistles, there was a time uh, when I was younger, young teenager, 
I wanted to go for a hike. And I thought, I'm going to hike up to the preacher's house because he lived up through a valley and kind of up on the hill over the way. And I thought, I'm going I'm to hike down through the creek and then I'm going to get up into that valley and I'm just going to go up there. And I thought, oh yeah, that'll be fun. And I forgot about poison ivy and I th- forgot about thorn bushes and I, I didn't bring a machete or anything and there was no trail that I was aware of. <laughs> and so as I'm hiking, I get in the middle of this, as they're called back east, jagger bush and just thorns everywhere all around me, and somehow I'm consumed in it. And I was just getting very frustrated because I, I, I was going to have to back my way out somehow, but I got in there, and it was just ah, so frustrating. Now, the other side of this is, how many of you like things that grow on thorn bushes? You, you like roses? That's one of the things you think of. Roses are pretty, aren't they? But also, there are many um, berries that grow on bushes that have jaggers or thorns, and... Um, and I happened to be in one. Sadly, the birds had eaten most of it, though. And so I picked a few, and then I backed my way out. But have you ever found yourself in life in the middle of just a mess, where it seems like the only thing left to do is back your way out? You have to humble yourself and say, I, I did something to get into this mess. I don't know how to get out of it. But the only way I can think to get out of it is just walk backwards and just get out. Now here's another thing. Psychologically, in your own brain, one way to get out of a mental trap, if you will, is to actually stand up and take steps backwards. That somehow that releases your brain to have new thoughts when you walk backwards. It's a, it's a psychological breaking tool of, of, a, of a mindset. So if you're somehow finding yourself in some terrible dilemma up here and you're just struggling, go find yourself a, a place that you can walk backwards and not fall down stairs or anything, right? Um, and, and spend just, I mean, it doesn't take but two, three steps. Sometimes you might want to make an activity out of it. Um, you know, and and try it for a longer time and see what it does to release your brain into new ways of thinking. It's not a bad idea at all. Um, But there was this guy named uh, Francis Schaeffer, and he wrote about that death is separation, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, And and one of the ways is it's psychological. Speaking of walking backwards, getting out of your own head, the psychological death of separation is this. It separates us from ourselves. When you sin, you have a mental break. It might not be huge. You might not go into some sort of psychosis where now you're mentally ill and need medication or or something special. But it does cause you to have a trauma in your own brain. And you go, oh no, what did I do? And you start talking to yourself. Have you ever done that? (laughs) And you have this, oh, that's not really who I am. I'm not that person. I don't do bad things. And then you go, "But, but I did. And you start to have anxiety around this and you feel vulnerable and you, and you feel kind of naked. If, if it's a big enough sin, right? You have some sense of shame, guilt, fear. Somebody's going to find out I did this thing. I've got to hide it. Delete, backspace, um, return this, do that, whatever. You know, put it back. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't do it. Not me. <clears throat> but if you live long enough in that way, it can be overwhelming. Now, another separation is spiritual, that uh, you start to ask this question, did, did God move? Why did God leave me? Why, I, come on, God, get back here. We used to be close, and you left. And in reality, we, we know what really happened. When we sin, we leave. Just like Adam and Eve went and hid, <clears throat> that's what we do with God. We don't typically run to God and tell him, hey God, I sinned, (laughs) and then he runs away. Because if we ran to him and told him, God, I've sinned, he would not run away. He would run closer to us and say, what happened? Tell me about it. Let's work through this. Let's understand what happened. I I love you. I forgive you. As you repent, he he would be right there for you, right? Now, a third way that Francis Schaeffer noticed our separation in death and sin is social that Adam and Eve were separated. They began to blame each other for everything, right? And, and then, the, later on, fighting and killing and murdering and, uh, and all kinds of horrible things happened, and it's a social separation. Um, fourth is physical. 
your body and your soul, we go into this platonic, which is Plato, uh, worldview, where we say, no, 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 this is my body, it's not important. My spirit is something else altogether, and it will float away and leave my body. But that is in no way in the scripture. Scripture says that your body will be resurrected, and you'd say, well, uh, what about the people who got burned up in fires? Come on. The people who got burned up in fires are the same as you. If your body sits around long enough, it decomposes, right? Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Here, we all return back to the soil and God says, don't worry about that. If I created you, I, I can recreate you. And that's Revelation. The end of Revelation says, hey, I'm going to bring about a new world, a new heaven and a new earth. I'm going to cleanse it with fire and I'm going to fix it all and it's all going to be right and good again. Remember Jesus, he rose in a body and he said, yours will be like mine, right? So body and soul and physical and also don't forget that we die. That's another part of death, right? I mean, we die. And who, who wants to die? Nobody really wants to die except for maybe when you get to a certain age and you're like, man, I've done it, I've had it, I'm, I've been here long enough, all my friends are gone. But if all your friends were still here and you, your body still worked right, would you want to leave? No. You'd be fine because you'd have your people around you and it would all be wonderful. Now, fifth is environmental. Nature isn't as it is meant to be, right? I mean, that's what we read just a moment ago. Verses 17 and 18 of chapter 3 of Genesis says that, you know, it's going to be hard work to take care of nature and, and you're going to fight with it all the time and thorns and thistles are going to come and, and it's just going to get difficult and, and it won't be an easy go. And so if you've ever cared for a yard, a garden, or, or tried to plant or grow anything, you know there's a thousand ways that those things can die. At the same time, the environment around us is struggling and desperate for a rebirth. And so... Jesus has taken the crown of thorns. Now, we've jumped through history very quickly and gotten to Jesus, but you'll notice that's the theme of what we do. We start in Genesis, we talk about Adam and Eve a bit, we go to Jesus, and then we go to Paul, and because I want you to see through the Bible what is happening here. So in John chapter 19, verse 2, the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. And you could say very easily that Jesus took the thorns that were meant for the first Adam and said, give those to me. I will wear them. I will accept them into my body. And those thorns, you could say, even smashed into his head. That was the intent to make him bleed. But you remember, he already had other thorns that had ripped open his entire back. He was just viciously beaten, right? Right? And he's about to go to the cross. And the soldiers are mocking him and saying, oh, look at him, he's a king. And they're falsely bowing down to him and slapping him and hitting him across the face. And at the same, Jesus is accepting those thorns into his heart. And he's saying, I see the sins of the world. I know all of the pain this world has to offer. And he dies a horrible death. And as Jesus does that, he says, I've taken the thorns for you. I've removed everything I can remove. If you'll just come to me, I can give you rest. I can set your heart at ease. If you'll confess your sins to God and to another, if you'll open your heart, then I can set you free from all that sin has done to you. And you'd say, well, well, well not fully. Well, exactly, because he hasn't returned. When he returns, what happens? He sets the whole world right. Your body is raised. More than likely, we'll all die before he comes. I mean, it is possible he could come right now or right now or tomorrow. I mean, at any time he could come, right? But whenever he does come, all the dead will rise in new bodies, just like Jesus's. He'll remake everything, fix it all. He'll set it all right. Everything will be good, like it was in the garden, and, and we'll live forever with him. And, and that is the, the exchange, if you will, that he has given us a new life in him that we start now. And we live into that life, and we enjoy his blessing as a result. So here's what Paul has to say about this in Romans chapter 8, 
verses 18 through 23, that all creation groans. Yet, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Do you suffer? Do you, do you have any pain in your life? Is there heartache? Have you experienced any kind of loss? Any kind of separation that we just talked about? If you live long enough, you, you lose your parents, right? If you live long enough, you, you might lose your children. If you live long enough, you, you lose your friends. If you live long enough, and it doesn't take very long, you, you lose friends not by death, but by anger and hostility and fights and, and terrible, horrible things. And, and you suffer in a way just by living. You, you might say all of life is some sense suffering. Because there's always pain. And the issue is, which are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the joy of life? Or are you daily just going, well, my knees don't work, my back don't work, my body don't work, my brain stopped working, I think I'm done. <laughs> or are you focused on the joy that is before you? That, that there are still people who love you and that you love, and there's still ways to care, and there's still ways to, to reach out and bless others. And a part of this is, are we focused on ourselves and what we don't get, or are we focused on what we might be able to give and bless others with? But yet, we suffer. And, and another way to think about this would, would be, and I think Paul talked about it, you know, birth. And oh, it, it shows up here in just a minute. Um, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. So all of the creation, is it anthropomorphized? I don't know. Does it, is it suddenly become human? Or does it have some sentient ability? I mean, we're studying this all the time. Do plants know when you're about to hurt them? <laughs> do, do dogs and, and cats understand what it is to be in love? Actually, I was just talking about that this morning, and I just heard about it yesterday, that actually they put dogs in an MRI machine, and um, they've trained them to, to study their brains and the chemicals released, and they found out that dogs release oxytocin when they see a human. And that is the, the, the love drug. And here's the bigger thing. They, they signaled the dog and trained the dog to say, which one do you love more? through pictures that, and, and signals, you know, because you can train a dog to, to salivate just by ringing a bell, right? If you, if you ring the bell and then feed it and ring the bell and feed it, it salivates. It gets excited about that and it says, oh, that's food. And you can train the dog through that, right? And so what they did is they trained the dog to lay still and they said, which do you like better, food or your master? Your person that you love, Right? And, and you know this if, you're, if, you're a, if you have a dog at home. I don't know about cats. Not quite the same. But if you have a dog at home, you know that if you bring food and put it down, it would rather have you pet it and love it than feed it. Gen generally speaking, I mean, a, a well-fed dog is, is not starving and, and, and wants you first. And that's what the MRI, MRI proved, is that dogs understand love. And they long for the relationship over the food. And they will choose the relationship before the food. And so all of creation, in some sense, especially dogs, cries out for when things are set right. And we're not fighting all the time. And we're not struggling all the time. And when nature is doing what nature's supposed to do. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, oh there it is, right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. I don't know about you, but yes, I do. How many of you have given birth? If men are raising their hand, this is a miracle. You have not done that yet. I, I'm not actually raising my hand. I'm just encouraging you. And I, what, what I've heard and what I've witnessed, because I was there in the room when both of mine were born, it's a bit, a, bit, a bit hard. It's not very easy to give birth. It's not like, oh, that was fine. Let's do that again, right? <laughs> I remember after, after uh, one of ours was born, uh, I think it was Zephaniah, because wheeled in, wheeled out. I mean, it was 
just as fast as could be. They, they put her in the, in the, on the table, had her all set up, and out can, comes Zeph, the second child. I mean, just super fast. And the nurse, as they're wrapping up and about to wheel, us, wheel her out of the room and me holding Zephaniah, and the nurse looks to Jamie and goes, so, you ready for another one? <laughs> She's like, I just got done with that one. I don't think so. I don't know. <laughs> but at the same, yes, she was excited for that next child. We didn't have another one, but it was the hope of that child, right? And there's always that hope. There's always that excitement. And, and after the child's born, you just want to love that child, and you're excited about it, and you're like, I'd go through that again. I love this. This is just wonderful, right? Now, in the same way, um, think about a kidney stone. There's a lot of effort exerted in passing one of those, right? But does anybody go, I'm looking forward to that. Let's do that again. <laughs> there's a, there's a, those are the two most painful, typical bodily functions that we do not desire. I mean, in, in terms of the pain of them. But at the same, you can see that they're very different in their outcome, right? The one, the way that you process it mentally, the way you think about it, it's like, no, no, I'll do this again and again and again. The other one, you're going, how do I avoid this at all costs? I, I do not want another one of these, <laughs> right? And, and the, the struggle of that is what we see here, that all of creation is screaming out saying, we've, we've given birth before, we, we know what this is, um, we, we've come to be, God called us into existence, and now we want God to call us back into the right existence before sin entered. We are struggling to understand how to live without sin. And we long for that, all of us. Everything. The whole world is begging and crying out, God, set it right. Set it right. <clears throat> we too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. I remember my mom towards the end, her life was never all that easy. She, she grew up in a, a mess, and as she got older, her body started to become very riddled with arthritis, and she had one hip replaced and the other hip replaced, and um, her, her back was bad. She had scoliosis. I mean, and she was all the time saying, I just can't wait for the new body. I can't wait for the new body. And I'm like, I hear you, Mom. Uh, my body's not, not as bad as yours, but man, uh, I'm guessing that new body's going to be awesome. And I always think superhero-like, right? I'll be able to fly. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be able to do all kinds of things. And in reality, even if I just had a body that didn't hurt, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? And if I could get to a place where my body wasn't falling apart and struggling and my mind worked as it was supposed to, like, that would be a joy, wouldn't it? Or I wouldn't forget stuff. I wouldn't, I wouldn't forget details that were meaningful and loving and important. But at the same, this hope is one that we cannot have shaken. If we really truly hope for this new creation, it should be something that we hold on to with our lives, with all that we are, to turn to God and say, yes, God, we long for this. So we're at the end, faith challenges. The faith challenges are, are rather... Not too difficult today. Um, there's only two of them. And I, I think they're pretty generic. Well, actually, the second one's going to be a challenge. But see, see what you do with it. It's a real challenge. The first one, uh, you don't have much of an option. It's wait. <laughs> wait. But, but there's a second part to it. Hold on. Just wait a minute. Just wait. Wait eagerly. Desire. The new heaven, the new earth. Be excited about it. Dream about it. Hope for it. Long for it. So much so that you want to tell others, I'm looking forward to this. Have you ever taken a trip and you've planned it all out and everything's all set out and you've got all the packing done and everything else and you've never told a soul? Like it's a secret trip? Most of us don't do that. Typically, we tell the neighbors, hey, I'm about to take a trip. Where are you going? Oh, I'm going to go here, there, and I'm going to do these things. We're going to eat this food and it's going to be amazing. Right? Right? And, and then you're notifying your credit card, please don't shut it off, we're, we're going to a new location, yes, there's going to be, and then, and then if you're really thinking ahead, you, you, you tell the mail service, hey, hold the mail, because it's going to be a while, we're not coming back, uh, we don't want it piling up, right? 
And, or you have one of the neighbors pick it up, and then you remember to quit ordering your Amazon packages and deliveries and such, and you're like, oh, put a stop to that, and you have a neighbor watch out for that as well, right? But what about, what about, what about heaven? Have you packed for that yet? How do you pack for heaven? What kind of anticipation do you have for being with God forever? And Moses and Elijah. And what about Solomon? Do you think he'll be there? David? Who, who's going to be there? Do you have an anticipation for that? Or are you excited about the potential that maybe that neighbor that's kind of crotchety and annoying that they might be there in their right mind and you might actually have a good relationship with them? Do you have an anticipation for, I don't know, who all might be there, that you might be able to love people like you've never loved them before and there will be no pain involved in that love? That you're not worried about what's coming next? That you're more like, no, I love them. They love me. And the world is whole. It's as it should be. And we, we enjoy this love. Wouldn't that be a, a nice thing? Not just nice, it'd be awesome, it'd be amazing. It would be wonderful. So look forward to it, anticipate it. Start talking about it, start planning for it. Dream of what that food will be like. I think there might be some, some wings, some ribs. <laughs> Anyways, number two, out love everyone. Now that's the hard one, isn't it? I mean, you can wait. To wait eagerly might be a little challenging, but you can work up that. But, but to out-love everyone. Why, what, why does that matter? It's because it is the way that we are, are to be known. As Christians, we're to be known for our love, by our love. Not our political views. Not our stances for this or for that. Not how morally astute we are. Not our intelligence. And not even our good looks. Right? <laughs> but we're supposed to be known by our love. And if we're known by our love, we should be out-loving everyone. Like, really loving so well. And I want to go back and get really historical about that for just a moment. Think about the reason the church grew in the first, second, third, fourth centuries. Do you, have you studied that at all? Why did the church grow? Why did it explode like it did? It wasn't because Paul was a great teacher and went everywhere and did all this stuff. That was good. That was helpful. But no, it wasn't that. It wasn't because Peter finally stood up and did the right thing and ate with the Gentiles. You know, it wasn't, wasn't that. Well, it was in part that a little bit, but, but, but it was really, there were plagues that ravaged, you, you know, we've heard about these things. Every hundred years, every 120 years roughly, there's a plague that comes through. Some new cold virus, something horrible that kills tons and tons of people. And that was one of the issues of the first, second, third, fourth century. That they, the historians wrote about it, and they would talk about these Christians who would go in when the plague was raging, and everyone else was running away from the cities and hiding out in the countryside until it subsided and was over and it was safe to come back, the Christians went in and took care of the sick people. That's pretty loving, isn't it? That's risking your own life before antibiotics, before Tylenol or, or aspirin even. I'm sure they had something to dull the pain. There was alcohol. And some other things. Even marijuana was used back then. But, but think about it. Christians went in when everybody else ran out. You know what else was really strange? Christians would go find the babies left for dead. If you didn't want your baby, there wasn't easy ways to get an abortion. But once you gave birth, if, if the father didn't want the child, they could just discard it. You could just take that baby and go set it out on the dump and let it die. And that was socially acceptable, you might say. But the Christians went and 
took those babies and raised them as their own. Not to be slaves in their house like others might have done, but they actually went and sought out the children that were unwanted, unloved, and they took them home. And you might say, well, that just sounds like adoption. But historically, adoption was only for adults. No one in historic times adopted infants or babies or small children. The only way you would be adopted was if you grew up, proved yourself, and you were a worthy individual, but you had no rank, status, or title. And I did, and I wanted to protect my heritage. So I would adopt you into my family so that I could say, you are my child, and you will now take over my power, position, place, my money. And I would do that even over my own children because you have proven yourself to be worthy, whereas my children haven't. Isn't that crazy? And so Christians went in where others would run away, and they loved better than anyone else. They loved so much that the emperors of their time would write to the other rulers around them and the ones under them and say, these Christians are doing such a good job of loving the people and caring for them and feeding the poor and the hungry. We've got to do something about this in our temples. We've got to change the way we... <laughs> we outloved everyone. I hope and pray that you are moving in that direction for yourself, that you can outlove others. So now I would ask you to pray for this love. From Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, Paul, again, in his prayer for the Ephesians, and us in a prayer for ourselves and our city and our community and our, our world. For this reason, we kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. We pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you all with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, And we pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. God, we continue to pray that you would fill us with your love, that you would challenge us and move in us and draw us into you that we might know love like we've never known. God, help us to be vulnerable. Help us to open our hearts to one another, to you, to our neighbors, to, to the community around us in a way that's appropriate for each setting, that we might show love like, like others are not. God, give us a heart that is going in where others are going out. God, give us a heart that takes care of those who may not be able to ever repay us, but blesses and heals and helps and encourages real help holy, healthy living. God, give us a desire to love like you love. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.